Do you plan to start data analysis and you are considering using Spark for it? For it? Have you just started using Spark and you want to avoid pitfalls? Are you already using Spark but you are not really sure or happy about its performance or stability? By the next of by, by the end of next half an hour, I'll, uh, you'll have an overview of most common problems faced when running Spark on production and solutions for them. My name is Martin. I'm data engineer at Tantus Data. I have almost a decade of experience. I've worked for companies like Spotify, Apple, a few small, smaller startups. So um, I have uh, quite some experience in data, and today I'll share the Spark part of it. Apache Spark, if only it worked, it's quite controversial. Uh, but it was inspired by a blog post I found a few years ago. Uh, so when I was writing my first Spark application, uh, I was looking for a solution for my problems, and I found this blog post, and author of this blog post was giving quite a lot of advices, but also he was complaining quite a lot about how hard it is to make Spark work reliably on production. So honestly, at that point, I felt exactly the same. But fortunately, quite a lot has changed since then. I've learned quite a lot, and also Spark improved quite a lot. So today, I'm not going to put you off from Spark. I'm going to share my lesson learned so it will be easier for you. We will start with Spark execution model, and that will be our foundation to reason and understand various problems you might face on scale. We will be looking at various classes of problems, like sizing executors, SKU data, locality, caching. I'll also mention a few words about uh, testing and debugging Spark. So what is Spark? It's a general engine for distributed data processing. It has support for various, uh, various programming languages. It, it supports an API for, for various program, programming languages. It has support for SQL. It has streaming library. It has machine learning library. But today, we're going to focus just on the core of Spark. Yeah, but what it really is? Why, why would you need it? So like one of the very common uh, use cases for Spark is that you have an application. You write your data and you have some analytics uh, who are connecting to the data in order to understand what's going on with your users, how, how they are using the application, how to make them pay, why don't they pay, to, to, to get basically some insight from your application. But that is tricky to scale. That is also a bit risky because your analytics might be a bit too greedy and, and, and then, then you have a problem with uh, with, your, with your app. So, so another approach, very, very common, very, very standard one, is that you store your analytics data somewhere completely else. So, for instance, in HDFS, and you use Spark to actually run analysis on top of, of, of your data. OK, let's Spark with an execution model. Spark introduces resilient distributed data set, and it's basically an abstraction on top of distributed data set. The resilient part of it means it can be recalculated if the data is lost. So we have a data set which, which is split into multiple partitions, into multiple nodes, uh, and it's tr transparent to you that it's distributed. And then when you run your Spark application, Spark pipelines operations until they can be done in context of just single partition, until operation on, on given partition don't need data from any other ones. And such a group of pipeline operations is called stage, but eventually you want to exchange data between partitions. Eventually you do a, an operation with like group by key. And such kind of operation is called shuffle, 
And that one we will be actually focus focusing on quite a lot because that is an expensive one and also that is causing quite a lot of problems. And your, your application usually consists of multiple stages, multiple shuffles. So, so far I was just saying Spark does this and that, but the actual execution unit in Spark is task. Task consists of a code which is supposed to be run on your data and a piece of data. So here you can see a block in HDFS, so a single block in HDFS and, and code which is supposed to be run on it is a task. And each stage consists of multiple independent tasks. Tasks get run in executors. Each executor can run one or more tasks at a time. And the at a time part I want to emphasize on, uh, because that means Spark can reuse the same executor to run task after task after task. It can pick up tasks from, uh, from the pending tasks queue. And it's a quite nice improvement comparing to uh, to Hadoop, so you don't have to spawn new JVM for each task. You can reuse the same JVM. And everything is orchestrated by a single, single driver process. So let's zoom into Shuffle. You might ask, why do I need to know what's going on under the hood? Why don't I just rely on the very nice Spark API? Why don't I simply let Spark do the job? And the answer is, you really need to understand what's going on under the hood in order to understand problems you might face and eventually solve them. So there is a task one which is processing some partition. It pipelines operation on, on that partition, so it pipelines operations like map, flat map, filter, and eventually we get a result. The result gets stored to a local disk, and it gets stored into multiple buckets. Each bucket is responsible for a certain group of keys. Look at the other tasks. They do exactly the same. So at the end of stage one, we have the result of, task, uh, of tasks written in, in local disks, so they can be pulled together. All the red buckets are responsible for the same group of keys. They can be pulled together and, process, uh, and, and stage number two can start processing it from there. So. As you can see, there is quite a lot of I.O. So we're writing data to disk, we're reading from it, we are sending data over the network. It's expensive, but let's not focus on it for now, because it might be that your application actually needs multiple shuffles and you can, cannot really avoid it. You, you, you simply have to do it. So what could possibly go wrong? Like famous last sentence. So imagine you have your application ready, you have tested it, lo it locally, you are quite confident about your business logic. You go to a cluster, you run it on a large data set, and you end up with one of these problems. Spark is complaining about two gigabytes a limit for, for the bucket I was showing you. Spark is complaining about timeouts. Spark is complaining about some memory-related problems or executor lost failure. None of them is really related to your business logic, but, but you still can see such kind of problems and you still have to tackle them. So why, why do we have them? It's quite often that you can see such group of problems when your executors are, uh, when your tasks are processing too much data. So the tasks are simply choking with the data. It's either somewhere inside the task, somewhere with, with garbage collection, or maybe the tasks are actually fine, but there are problems when the data gets sent over the network. Uh, so, there are, so where do you look for culprits? How do you actually investigate it? 
you have a pretty nice Spark UI for it, and it gives you a lot of information, but the, the information I want to focus on right now is a stage overview, which gives you a DAG visualization, which is kind of an execution plan, but also it gives you metrics per each individual task. So, yeah. Oh, really? It works for me. <laughs> yeah, so once again, uh, there are multiple tabs there. You have, um, you have an overview of what your execution plan looks like. Now I have to go back. Yeah. And you get an uh, overview of metrics per task. Uh, so the ones you definitely want to focus on is status of your tasks. So if you can see tasks failing, you obviously need to go and dig into it and, and look for a reason they are failing. But another metrics um, which are super important for you is the duration of your tasks. Garbage collection time, uh, which tasks spent on, on, the, on the garbage collection. And uh, last but not least, amount of data um, sent, sent or, or created, created during the shuffle. So you want these value, values to be not too large, and you usually want this value to be kind of equal. So if all of the values are large, or some of, the, some, some of your val values are li really large, that means you, you have a problem that, that means you have, uh, you have something to investigate. And if you can see, if you suspect your tasks are processing too much data, what you could do is you could control, you could try to control the level of parallelism. So if you pass a num partition parameter to any method which is triggering shuffle, you basically tell Spark, oh, I want the group by to produce this many buckets, this many uh, tasks. So I want to process the result of group by key in that many tasks. Of course, you could also try to give, give your executors more memory, and sometimes that works, but, but you are limited. That doesn't scale, scale very well. You cannot do it every single time. And one more thing you could do is you could trigger an artificial shuffle. So um, you could trigger repartition uh, to, to explicitly tell Spark that you want to, even though you don't need it from the point of your business logic, you want to repartition the data in order to make uh, Spark's life easier. So look, we have stage, which is processing data in three tasks, and those tasks are choking. So what you do, you pass larger number of partitions as a parameter, and you end up with more tasks, but each of them is smaller. Each of them is processing less data. Each of them is pro uh, producing smaller buckets, so, uh, so the stage downstream has easier job as well. But it's not always that simple. Sometimes you, you tell Spark to, to use to, to process the data in a lot of tasks, and most of the tasks are doing basically nothing, but one of them or a few of them are, are super heavy. So th these kind of problems are co caused by skewing your data. And to give you an example, if you are processing data per country, some of your countries are just heavier. Some of your countries has more transactions, more users, and, and if you group by uh, by the country code, you end up with, with different sizes of your tasks. Another example is uh, key being null. So if you allow your keys to be null, and if you group by it, you might end up with like 50% of your data ending up in the same task. And regardless of how many of them you have, most of the job, job uh, is done in, in, one, in one task. So very general technique to, to deal with such kind of problem is introducing a salt 
to your keys, introducing some randomness to your keys. So, look, we have uh, a few keys foo, and let's say we have too many, too many of them, and we want to split them, split them in between multiple tasks. We don't want them all to be processed in one task. So we add some random, random values to them, so then they can be processed in separation, and then you are responsible for making sure you, you merge the result back together, you clear the, the randomness you introduced, and, um, and making sure that your business logic stays correct. Another subject which is very important when, when you want to actually benefit from using Spark is caching. So I mentioned RDD so far, but I have not mentioned that RDDs are lazily evaluated. So Spark tries to pipeline pipeline as many, as many operations as possible. It runs them when, when the data actually have to be materialized, so it does not run them uh, on the fly. It does not run them, uh, it, it does not store any intermediate result to disk as well. So we have the blue RDD1, which is calculated out of multiple operations, and then we reuse them. We, we re reuse RDD1. So we call some, some more operations on RDD1 and we store the result to disk. And let's say we do exactly the same to RDD1 or maybe some other operation, but, but, but we, uh, we, we, we again uh, call more operations on RDD1, we store the result to disk, and it works fine with one caveat. The blue part gets executed twice. And you might be disappointed, you might ask why, but this is simply what Spark does. It avoids s storing intermediate data to disk, if, and if you don't have the result of calculation of RDD1, it has to recalculate everything. But Spark gives you a mechanism to actually control it, so, so Spark gives you caching mechanism. So whenever you see a situation like that, when you have a branch in your execution plan when you re reuse some RDDs, you can cache the result. And you can cache it to memory, you can cache it to disk, you can cache it to HDFS, you can control the replication factor, so into how many nodes a given partition goes, and it's up to you what decision you make. So first of all, as, as you probably already noticed, your, your memory will be, will be limited, so you cannot cache everything. And the question is, what do I cache? So in order to decide what to cache, you have to know that you cannot pin an RDD to memory. You cannot prioritize RDDs. It's just a LRU algorithm. So caching one thing might mean you're losing another thing. So you have to make sure that what you're caching is the important one, is the heavy to calculate one, the, one the, the thing which you actually want to keep, and you have to make sure that you are not too greedy. Um, so, so you are not losing some, some, some not that heavy to calculate RDD. So, sorry, you are not losing the heavy to calculate RDD because you're caching something not that important. If you are not sure what to expect, what sizes your RDDs are, you can always go to Spark UI and it tells you uh, how, much, uh, how much memory RDDs are taking in, uh, in cache. Um, one more uh, important thing is that you don't necessarily have to fit all the RDD in memory. You can cache just, just part of it. I mean, Spark will do it for you. The only requirement is that the whole partition of an RDD has to fit in memory. So Spark either caches the whole partition or just nothing. OK, so we have a strategy for, uh, for caching uh, data in memory. But why don't, to, why don't we just cache uh, everything we reuse to disk? And it might be a bit counterintuitive, but storing data to disk sometimes can be just more expensive than, than just recalculating the data. So it sounds like a waste, 
but still, sometimes your calculation of uh, of your RDD is completely fine, and it uh, it's especially true when when you, when you are considering caching with replication factor or caching with um, caching in HDFS, which will be much more uh, much more expensive because because then then you have to deal with with network and so on. Uh, last thing to remember is that the buckets I was showing you in Shuffle, they get stored and they are kept by Spark, so they can be reused. So when you recalculate, when Spark recalculates your data, it doesn't recalculate it from from, from the very beginning. It's, it recalculates it. It recalculates it from the uh, the last shuffle. All right, um, let's have a look at what size your executors should be, because that's, that's a very common, common problem. So you control how many CPUs you are giving to your executors, and that means, um, that means number of tasks run, run in parallel per an executor, and you also control amount of memory. And you have a choice of running very small ones, which are, and many of them per node, and you can have very large one, which is occupying most of the node resources. You can also run anything in between. The actual decision is very much uh, dependent on your workload, but there are a couple of bullet points uh, I, want to, I want to work on. So first of all, Spark can benefit from running multiple um, multiple tasks in the same JVM. So it can share some variables across tasks. So there, there will be just one copy of this variable in t instead of uh, a, a copy per task. Also, when you, when you are uh, heavily caching things, it's just easier for Spark to fit uh, the cache data in, in memory if you have like one big chunk of memory instead of, uh, instead of smaller ones. On the other hand, when you run uh, when you run very large executors, it's very likely that you will get into garbage collection problems. Um, also, uh, one more notion about the large ones: if you if your job is not that large and you and you still want to run large executors, so let's say you have hundreds of hundreds of nodes uh, in your cluster and you run just tens of executor but large ones, that means you don't utilize, uh, you don't utilize uh, all the resources, you, don't, uh, you also might have problems with locality, which I'll, I'll get to. So the general hints are, if, if your workload is like ETL, I would say in most cases there is no point in, in playing with uh, very large executors and, and, and uh, risking garbage collection problem. I would start with, with small ones. On the other hand, if you, if you very much rely on caching or if you are using broadcast variables, uh, you might need large ones, so you will have to play with large executors and, and make sure you not end up in pr with problems. Before we go further, let's have a quick look at um, Spark memory model. So you decide how much JVM memory you give, you give to an executor. This area, this space is split into three areas. Area for your user program, area for intermediate buffer, buffers used during shuffle, and area for caching. Up until Spark 1.6, you could you had to actually control that. Uh, from 1.6, Spark tries to balance it, but you still can, can switch back and, and, uh, and decide that you are smarter than Spark and, and uh, assign some values to it. Another very important memory, which is outside of the heap, is memory overhead. This is a memory needed by a container, but also this area is where all the off-heap memory goes. So if you know that you are allocating off-heap memory, or if you are using the library which does that, you have to make sure you make it large enough. So keep that in mind. Uh, also keep, ki keep in mind uh, the operating system. So 
don't be too greedy, leave some resources for the operating system. If you are using on Yarn or, or, or system like that, probably your admin took care of that, but otherwise, make sure you, you don't allocate everything. Um, if you are not uh, sure about the memory co consumption, you can always check, just play around, cache an RDD, check how much it takes, so you get an overview of, of what you're dealing with. Uh, one more thing which is worth trying if you are not sure how many executors you want, how, how much resources you want to give. So let's say you have a job which, the same job which, is, which sometimes is taking small input, sometimes is taking very large input. You can play with dynamic resource allocation in that situation. So Spark will start with small number of executors and it will just bump it up while it sees uh, pending tasks. Locality, I've mentioned that already. So the concept is borrowed from Hadoop and the concept is super simple. So node one contains block one and you want to process that block. So it's easier to, sh uh, to move the execution to the node one rather than moving the data somewhere else. Um, and Spark does, does it for you automatically. Spark tries to achieve as, highest locality, as high local, locality as possible. But in some situations, it's not possible, but you can, you can help Spark to achieve it. So let's say you have 100 nodes and you have just 10 executors and you, ha and you have HDFS blocks on all 100 of the nodes. So it's not possible to run everything locally because simply you have just execution on 10 nodes, so um, the rest 90 nodes have to, have to transfer the data. What you could do in order to help Spark is you could increase number of executors. So you make it more likely that Spark has an executor which is waiting and ready to pick up a task in certain locality level. Um, if your job is not that large, on the other hand, maybe it's just better to leave it as is. If you really want to uh, control the locality, you, can, you could play with Spark locality weight parameter. So that's a par uh, that, that param tells Spark for how long it should wait uh, for, for running a job on given locality level until it just gives up and runs it somewhere else. Uh, so by using this param, you can enforce locality. You can give it up entirely, but it's super, super tricky. And the locality level uh, also you can uh, check in, in Spark UI, and, and it's a property per task. So you can see what locality level each task run on, and, and you usually want to see node local, not, um, not something different. Um, let's have a, a similar exercise we've done with uh, Shuffle. Let's do it with Join. Uh, so the regular Shuffle Join works very similar to, to what happened in in group by. So in both stages, Spark has to split the result of each task into buckets, and then all the same uh, like buckets responsible for the same keys are going together, and they get joined in stage three. And as I already uh, mentioned, that's an expensive one. Sometimes you cannot, uh, you cannot avoid it. But let's see how we could improve it. And improving Shuffle very often means avoiding it. So look at this execution plan. Stage one is doing group by key followed by map. Stage three is doing exactly the same. And then stage four is joining the result of them to together. But you can do some tricks. You can be nicer to Spark in certain situations. So if you know that the map after group by is not modifying the keys, you can tell it to Spark by using map values instead of map. So if your 
uh, if you are modifying just values in your key values pairs. Uh, the, other, the other thing you could do is to make sure you are using the same number of partitions in, in both group bys. So then Spark knows that we have exactly the same partitioning scheme in both group bys, and we have not modified the keys, so the, the result partitioning scheme is exactly the same, so it can use this fact and end up with such an execution plan. So we used to have five stages and four shuffles between them. Now we have two shuffles less, which is usually quite a big win. And what happens here is the group by key, then followed by map values, and then join happens all in the same place. There is no data need, uh, needed to be sent over the network. Another technique to improve shuffle, and again, improving shuffle means avoiding it, is broadcast variable. Broadcast variable is uh, a variable which you can send from a driver to every single, to every single um, executor. It has to fit in memory. Uh, so imagine you have to join RDD1, which is very, very large and consists of many partitions, and you have RDD2, which is tiny. So instead of shuffling RDD1, shuffling RDD2, and then joining them together, what you could do, you could broadcast RDD2, so it resists in each executor, and then join RDD2 to just single partition of, uh, of RDD1 in memory. And then you end up with, with the join result without shuffling RD, the very large RDD1. So just a quick recap. If you control number of partitions and Mm, and if you are using map values, if you know that you, you don't modify your keys, that might be super helpful to Spark to avoid shuffles. If you are joining small RDDs with very large one, consider using broadcast variable, consider broadcasting uh, small RDDs. Filter before the shuffle, not after it. That's quite obvious. Use reduce by key where you can. So I was referring to group by key all the time. But, um, but reduced by key can, um, can actually um, limit amount of data sent over the network, and it's, it's some, somehow related to, to what combiner it in, in Hadoop does. Test your code. I cannot stress it more. I mean, it's not only about your quality, it's also about how fast you can iterate. If, you, if you're testing your, testing your code locally, you, you avoid waiting for resources, going for a cluster, waiting until it, uh, it finishes the job, and then checking the, the very large data set. Test as much as you can locally, and Spark actually supports that pretty well. Make sure you know what you are optimized for. Do you, do you want to see good wall clock time? Do you want to see good resource, uh, resource usage? Or maybe your time is that precious that you don't want to rub it all on, on some small improvements. Um, also, make sure you know the priorities of your jobs. So, so make sure that you are not hogging the, the, the whole cluster um, and, and other people with maybe more important jobs are waiting for you. Make sure you have some guidelines, because it's very likely that in your team, this is you, a few developers, and maybe a few analytics, and maybe a few people who want to run SQL from time to time, and they are not that much into what's going on under, under the hood. But make sure you, you share the best practices so you don't dig into the same problems all over again. And the last comment is, somehow related to the title of this talk. So Spark actually works, but it really helps to know what's going on under the hood. And, and the more you understand, the more you work with it, the more you like it. OK, we, I think we have a few minutes for questions, right? Let's thank the speaker first for the talk. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Other questions in the audience? There's one here in the front. Yeah. Hi, you had this one slide where you said that uh, if you 
put on too many executors, the, you get into GC problems? No, it was if the executor is very large. So if you, let's say, you, you want to process um, a lot of tasks in context of the same machine, so uh, then you need to give it a lot of memory, and then for large, uh, for large heaps, it doesn't really behave very well. So I got it wrong because uh, you can have actually big boxes with lots of cores and you will benefit from them, right? So yes, yeah. in certain situations, yes. But, but for instance, if you are running ETL, you're probably not that heavily relying on caching. So I would say it doesn't make much difference if you small run once and, and, you, know, and you step back from all these garbage collection problems. Thanks. More questions? There's one here on the right, right side for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you have any advice about running Spark on Yarn? Um, anything, any pitfalls to, to look at or anything like that? But can, can you be a bit more specific? Um, um, I'm basically just someone who's kind of quite new to Spark, and I just wondered if there's anything I should be worrying about if I was running it on top of Yarn versus running it no, if it, if it was like three years ago, I would say you, you should have been very worried. Right. But right now, it works quite well. Okay, thank you. Well, we've got time for, for one more question. Here you go. Uh, what is the suggestion about runtime of each task? Should you, because we saw there are only 25 milliseconds. Yeah, that was just a fake yeah. example. Yeah. Uh, so I would say, uh, again, it's, related, it's, it's um, depending on your workload, but I would say a few minutes probably. Um, probably a few, a few minutes, because usually, at least if you are running data from HDFS, you, you are not, each task is in the beginning reading, reading like a few hundred megs. So, so it doesn't make, if, if it runs for, for, for more time, it's, it's starting, to, it started, starting to be worrying. But, but um, depend, depending on your on your workload, once you you know you, you once you work with it with with your specific application, you get you get the feeling. In general, I would say a few minutes up to ten minutes. Thanks. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks for okay, I just, we'll I, just, I just want to thank you very much. Uh, if you have more questions, just, just reach out to me. I will be around. Um, if you have more questions about the presentation, if you have more questions about your use case, and also if you're interested in, uh, in consulting services or, or training services, reach out to me. Thank you.